friends, and welcome again to Liberation Lectionary. I am one of your co-hosts, uh, Reverend Francisco Garcia, and my co-pilot is... Jamie Edwards Acton, out in Los Angeles. And here I am still holding down the fort as the Chicano transplant to Nashville. So, I <laughs> uh, hope everyone is well and safe. Um, today, uh, we are going to... Well, first, again, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, Liberation Lectionary is uh, an attempt of, of the, t the, the two of us have to just make sense of the gospel um, in the, from the lens of liberation. As, uh, as priests and activists and organizers, we really feel that the central call of, of scripture is to find the, the, how liberation um, plays out in our day and age. And, and with that, um, you know, what, are the, what are the tools that we need and how do we do the work in the here and now. And so that's, that's our attempt and in our effort. We're looking at uh, the Gospel of Matthew 13, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, 18 through 23. Is it the sixth Sunday after Pentecost? Sixth Sunday after Pentecost, proper, or tenth Sunday in ordinary time. In gotcha. year so, yeah. For those who, who like to speak Episcop Episcopalian. <laughs> um, but we know that the Revised Common Lectionary is used by a number of different denominations, so we hope that many folks are following along. Um, and so uh, before we get into the, the reading the gospel passage and starting to break down some of the things that we see um, uh, in this scripture, I think it's important just to sort of look at the, the whole backdrop of the gospel of Matthew. We've been in Matthew now um, since we started. Um, we're now on episode four. And, um, you know, a New Testament scholar that uh, I follow his work regularly through Working Preacher. Some people know it's a really good resource if you want to get deeper into um, sort of like the biblical uh, analysis of text. Um, Matthew Skinner, uh, who is a regular on that Sermon Brave Rainwave podcast, um, talks about how it's really easy to um, misinterpret, you know, the scripture. And there's so many places that we might want to go with it. And sometimes we might sentimentalize the scripture or we might think of a self-serving uh, explanation, but he really focuses on the core themes that come up again and again throughout the gospel of Matthew. And I think these are worth revisiting and they have to do with um, the, the, the forces that the kingdom of the world brings as opposed to the kingdom of God, which Jesus is trying to remind listeners, uh, disciples and, and, and anyone that would listen. And the themes are having to do with evil um, persecution, uh, facing backlash, right, for sharing the good news and for preaching the truth, uh, speaking truth to power, uh, issues of worry, right, we heard about that uh, about um, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, and wealth, um, how wealth is a stumbling block to getting to the truth of the gospel and really uh, allying ourselves with God's vision of wellness for everybody. Uh, and not holding on to the earthly possessions. And so these are themes that I think we need to revisit again and again, and they all pertain to liberation in some way. So we'll see them play out in today's text. Thanks, Francisco. So I'm going to read this. This uh, comes from the New Revised Standard Version, and uh, this is Matthew 13, 1 through 9, 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. 
As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make the... the first opening salvo here, uh, Francisco, and just make a, a brief comment and then we'll get into our typical back and forth. And oh, two comments. First is, I, can, I, I, I just can't imagine Jesus teaching in parables and then uh, following up with an explanation of the parable. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lay that on the table. So, right. but, but we're, gonna, we're gonna take this on as we have it here. Um, just, and I say that only because uh, the parable of the way that Jesus taught is, the multi-dimensional uh, meaning, right? As Walter Wink used to say, you know, uh, or describe the parables uh, it's of Jesus, like looking through a, a, a diamond, right? And it's like, has all these kind of refractions and reflections of light. And he's but, building something. And he's building something, right, you exactly. You follow the whole narrative, which is why we have to look at the whole context, yep. That's right, so, and I'm always, you know, I think we both have a hermeneutic of suspicion, and that includes, you know, gospel writers too, so. That's the uh, work of liberation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but the first just quick comment I'll say is, um, it, on this first half, again, focusing on the first half, I have two kind of thoughts, and I'll just give my first one is that first, I love the, um, it makes me think of the story of the prodigal son, which rightly should be called the prodigal father, the, the, the parable of the prodigal father. And, uh, and because we have, and it, it makes me think of that because here we have this sower, just like tossing seeds everywhere. And we know how precious, especially back in that time, I would imagine. I mean, we have, at church, we have, um, you know, uh, a, a bunch of uh, gardens and growing space all over the campus. And, uh, you know, seeds are a big deal. Seeds are precious. It's not just something like uh, to waste. And so the first thing that stands out to me is just the prodigal nature or the prodigal kind of actions of the sower, tossing seeds and possibilities um, and for abundant life, just like freely and recklessly wherever and scandalously uh, wasteful and scandalously extravagant um, and all these inchoate uh, possibilities that are just being not tossed wherever but upon whomever too which really catches my attention and uh, and not upon you know a, a, you don't necessarily need any particular credentials, right? Uh, to have this stuff showered upon you, these opportunities uh, for abundance uh, thrown upon you. Uh, you don't need a particular religious uh, or class membership. You don't need a societal status or any kind of power uh, or privilege. And uh, so the first comment I just wanna make is this prodigal nature of the sower and how this is a counter narrative uh, to the claim, you know, that, um, uh, that still is pretty popular today, um, that, uh, you know, that believing, right, is a prerequisite uh, for blessing, and, that's, and, uh, and that somehow um, that, uh, yeah, that the blessing and then blessing is talked about as somehow kind of proof that, you know, only the seed is scattered in particular uh, you know, communities or particular people or whatever. So I think this is a counter narrative to that whole thing. Right. And I think I was thinking that how, how this uh, today's uh, parable uh, res may, might resonate powerfully with you, especially given the, the, the gardens that you have um, mm -hmm. over at your church. So um, what do you think about this idea that, um, you know, you, you talked about the seeds being thrown out extravagantly um, and I'm also thinking about what happens um, in the soil itself, right? And another, another piece, that, a commentary that I was reading um, was from the perspective of a gardener saying that, for me, it's more about the soil, even though this is about, you know, seeds and sort of if they, if they bear fruit, but you got to have good soil. And then that's what it says towards the end of this passage, um, for what was sown in good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it and bears fruit. Um, so what, what, what do we make of this, of this metaphor of the soil? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for uh, me, this really jumped out powerfully. Be, uh, just in general, like you said, I'm a big uh, kind of urban garden 
person uh, through my church, uh, especially churches. We have two gardens at each church. And then even in my, at my own home, um, uh, I, I have a garden as well. And I, I, what, I, what I see in this parable is like you're alluding to is that this is not simply an observation, right, of kind of where seed lands and what happens, but this is a call to action, right? This is a call to do something about the damn soil, right? I mean, if you, if, uh, if, if we're going to grow something, anybody who's ever tried to grow something that it's all in the soil, 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 soil. And it, it may, I saw this movie uh, a few uh, weeks ago, which I should have seen years ago, because I think it was made in like 2015 or something. But uh, you know about uh, Ron Finley in from South Central Los Angeles, and he's known as the gangster gardener. And uh, I first uh, was acquainted with him um, through uh, his work here in Los Angeles, but then he did a TED talk that was really famous. And now you see him do all kinds of uh, stuff. Um, but he, he was just this guy, right, living in South Central uh, community. And he was frustrated um, that uh, where he lived in his neighborhood that people had to drive like 45 minutes right i mean or take public transportation like 45 minutes just to get some fresh produce you know just to get a fresh tomato and so he became frustrated with that reality he started growing food at his home and in 2010 is when this all started and so he grew in his front yard he transformed he took up this dead brown grass that was just like hard dirt and dead grass and he turned you know he started planting and it turned into uh, he talks about turning you know a south central from a food desert into a food forest and uh, and he he did and he grew up this um, just amazing kind of um environment uh, but one thing he did which i love the best is that he planted his garden in the parkway in between the sidewalk and the street and uh, that got uh, that caught the attention of the city you know, the city, uh, the powers that be, right? And, and they came and they cited him for illegal gardening. He was cited for illegal gardening. And I want to uh, know the bureaucrat that did that. Oh my, I doubt he's, he's probably not working anymore, I hope. <laughs> but, but instead of backing off, Ron Finley organized, right? And you say this all the time, right, uh, Francisco? And don't complain, organize. And uh, so, he, instead of backing off, he got together neighbors and he got together uh, green activists and uh, he went about, um, you know, challenging this citation and not just his personal citation, but the law itself. And he was able to get this law booted, right? Uh, so he could, so not only he could grow in the parkway, but anybody, anybody could grow garden uh, in the parkway. And so I think it's, and what he shows in this movie too, is that it's not just about growing food, right? Uh, this movie shows about the community, the people. Uh, so there's, there's, there's these two parallel things which matches this parable. He is creating uh, an actual garden out of hard soil that is like on the path, rocky thorns, all those. And he's turned to this rich, lush uh, soil that just, you know, grows stuff you couldn't even imagine growing in L.A. And, um, and it's amazing. But what also he does is through his own garden and then the work he does with other community gardens in South Central is he shows how a garden can be a, kind of a parallel reality to how community is nurtured that comes around that garden, right? And the people in it start to grow and thrive and flower and bloom and then give fruit. And these people that have been written off, right? These are ex you know, gangbangers or current gangbangers, whatever, you know, drug dealers. He, the whole movie is about how these, these lives are transformed uh, in this, by this garden that's created, this physical garden, but also this uh, metaphorical garden of the community uh, with this rich soil. So I love the movie. I highly recommend it. It's called, Can You Dig This? Uh, and I think it came out in 2015. That's awesome. I love that. And it, yeah. there's so many things that come up for me as I hear you describing this. And um, it, uh, it makes me think about, well, first of all, good soil, yeah. right? Yeah. And as it says in the passage, good soil does not have anything to do with it being like wealthy, right? It doesn't have high priced, expensive seeds. <laughs> no. Or, you know, um, you know. Uh, boutique soil. No, boutique, it's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seeds. Artisan soil. No, it's not that. Good so. soil can, is, is about um, authenticity. It's about um, community, um, good soil and, 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 
the, uh, the things that bear fruit can happen in the, what people might think of as the least likely, likely of places. So we have that example. We have the example from years back from Los Angeles of the South Central farmers yep. and, and immigrant communities with very few resources doing amazing things with small plots of land. And so now we have this explosion of urban gardening, but that really came from grassroots, indigenous uh, community that's knowledge. Right. And I think that's what good soil is about. And it, it's here in the passage where, where Jesus is giving the explanation and says, what happens when the soil is, is sort of like, eh, so-so. Maybe you're trying, but you're not quite getting there. It's kind of a half-hearted attempt. And I love where it says here, um, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. Mm -hmm. But think about that. I mean, from, from our liberation uh, sort of vantage point, there are so many places um, in today's world where this is the case, where people perhaps hear the cries of injustice, they hear the calls of the need for, for um, you know, systemic racism to be challenged. They might even feel a little bit of a tug, but they're not quite ready to go there, right? They hear it, but it doesn't yield anything. And so there isn't transformation yet. And it really does take the cultivation of good soil over, over a period of a long time to be able to do this work. Right yeah. now, we, we're sort of in a catalytic moment where there's a lot of possibility, but that, 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 that wouldn't be the case. Like we said in past um, episodes, if there hadn't been people cultivating and building, doing the hard gritty work of, of cultivating good soil. Yeah. Uh, it, it just makes me also think about, you know, I'm going to get a little, I guess, academic or theological here, but in the liberation theology tradition, um, folks probably have heard about the preferential option for the poor, right? From, you know, one of the core premises of liberation theology, which says, God, uh, if there is a God, right? I'm, you know, I'm going to be called a, a heretic now for asking that question, <laughs> but where, where God exists, it's in understanding that, um, that, there is a uh, partiality towards suffering, towards the suffering, towards the marginalized, towards people who've been outcast. We see it time and time again throughout the scriptures. And that's the preferential option of the poor. It doesn't leave out the rich, mm -mm. but it means that we have to organize and create a world where there no longer are these conditions of, 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 of these gaps, these huge wealth um, gaps that, that create these uh, horrible drastic conditions for people. But in addition to this idea of the preferential option for the poor, there's an additional uh, uh, concept called the epistemological uh, privilege of the poor. Mm -hmm. Epistemology meaning knowledge. And so we lift up grassroots knowledge, the knowledge from indigenous contexts. Um, and I think when I think about good soil and I think about the story you shared about the gangster gardener, I think about the epistemological, it's a hard word to say, epistemological <laughs> privilege yeah. of the outcast, the marginalized, and lifting that up. And that's, I think, what, when we look at the gospel from, from liberation, that's what comes up. That's right. And, no, and just for the record, nobody's going to ever accuse me of being an academic. And uh, that's why Francisco is here on the call. How about but a heretic? I, a heretic often. But, uh, you and I both, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I would just put it in, you know, I, I, I'm totally in agreement with you. And I would just say like, you know, that the whole preferential option and the epistemological privilege of the poor is, is an invitation to like where we need to situate, right, ourselves when we're trying to read scripture, when we're trying to interpret scripture. If you're high and mighty and lofty and empowers in positions of power and privilege, uh, you're just not going to get it. I don't, you know, I mean, there's just no way around it. You're not going to grasp uh, the full uh, power. And I'm not just, I mean, physically, I mean, we have to put ourselves, you know, kind of perspective wise in those, in that position where we can really read scripture and understand it. I'm going to take a crack at the second half. You've already touched upon some sure. of this stuff. Um, and uh, although, you know, uh, Jesus is never ambivalent about wealth and stuff, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a little uh, different tack about, and I'm going to try to apply this to what's happening um, in our country in, in uh, right now, the conversation about, um, you know, systemic racism and uh, white supremacy and uh, whiteness and anti-blackness and all that. 
And and here I I'm gonna um in again where I'm I'm in, you know I'm ambivalent about this explanation of the parable, but I'm gonna take it as it is. And uh, rather than just talking about uh, the word of God as just words, I don't think anywhere in scripture is that is that how that's how it's understood. And although in, in many uh, areas of the church today, that's where it's understood, right? That's how it's understood is these literal words on a page, which becomes very complicated for anybody who knows, like, this was not written in English. There's a thousand something versions in English, you know, so it becomes very difficult uh, kind of argument to sustain. But rather than words on a page, I see the word of God here as an embodiment or an experience of God's compassion, love, and solidarity, and justice. And uh, so when these seeds being scattered, right, everywhere and upon whomever. And, um, and so for me, again, I'm thinking about the, our conversation around racism and, and all this. And I'm going to speak for myself here and, for, and, 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 and presumptuously for some of my white siblings uh, around the world here or in this country. And the way I, looking through that lens of what's going on from being a white man and participating in this conversation and trying to acknowledge my, my own kind of role and my own place in this, my own perspective, the way I see this parable is that the path is, um, you know, those seeds that fall, these, again, the seeds as being this, these embodiments of possibility around God's love and justice and compassion and, and newness, right, uh, uh, and solidarity, that uh, the, the path represents for me those of us who are unwilling and unable to even consider, right, to consider as valid, uh, to affirm the experience of uh, BIPOC, uh, you know, Black, indig uh, Indigenous, and people of color in this in this country. And that's been going on for centuries. And that, you know, there, there's a lot of people on the path, right? This is not the path we want to be on when we talk about following Jesus, okay? This is the wrong path. Um, so that's how I see the path, the rocky soil. I, I kind of hear those, that, that those of us who are initially um, open to hearing um, about and learning about the experience um, of BIPOC in this country and, their, and, and then our own complicity, right, in that experience, our own participating in that privilege. Um, but we lack the endurance, right, to stay in the conversation. We lack the endurance and, uh, to keep going deeper, to keep challenging our uh, consciously or unconscious, uh, you know, kind of cashing in on our privilege at the expense of uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And when the conversation and the work becomes personal, when it becomes hard, when it becomes confessional, we bail. And, um, and then, uh, and we make excuses for that, right? Bullshit excuses. And then uh, there's, uh, and then the thorns, right? Which again, is it's clear Jesus is a attaching that to wealth, but I'll I'll attach it to kind of another form of power, um, and that we choose uh, or wealth too. In this case, is that is that when these con when these uh, when the conversation emerges, right? We have an opportunity to really lift it up and seek liberation in the midst of this conversation. Uh, some of us choose property over people. Some of us choose peace over justice. And some of us, unfortunately, choose privilege over liberation. And I hear in this passage, uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the passage, that we need good soil. We need to create space where this work can really happen authentically, like you said, uh, and where we can grow uh, in our healing, where we can grow in our uh, wholeness and grow in our uh, justice and equity uh, towards everyone in our community, um, particularly those who have been on the on the on the short end of that historical stick. And so, um, but good soil doesn't just happen. We have to put the work in. We have to put the sweat in. We have to ache. We have to nurture. We have to acquire the right tools. We have to turn things over. We have to make sure there's water and light that's getting on what, where light needs to be shown, right? Where light is needed and cultivating good, rich uh, soil for real transformative conversations and experiences around systemic racism and whiteness and white supremacy and anti-blackness. Uh, this is not for the faint of heart, Jesus would say. Right. Uh, but we're all called to do this work uh, and the fruit of that work will be liberation. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a that's a good um, sort of breakdown of these things. And what comes up for me is is is, a, is kind of a, a, a new understanding, too, that. Along with uh, Jesus's message in other places, um, 
that good soil, I don't, I don't think that Jesus is saying that this is a sort of a zero sum game. Right. I think that this, uh, the, the rocky soil, the, 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 the thorny soil, all of it is potential, uh, potential has potential to be good soil. So if, if we consider, however we want to think about this, but if we consider ourselves as the soil, um, the seeds of liberation, the seeds of consciousness, the seeds of, of a path towards um, a love and compassion uh, infused justice, um, we all have the potential to, to, to have that, to be cultivated, have that cultivated within us to be good soil. Even if our first reaction or ha is, is the, the one of, of um, like you said, not, not quite ready yet, you know? So I think that no one is finished um, and there's a pathway for all people. I believe no one is beyond sort of redemption I mean, even the hardest. I'm, I'm counting on it, Francisco. So <laughs> all of us. I mean, I think that's part of what gives us, right? Yeah. A, some some semblance of hope for the world and for each other is that even as things are so hard, um, and that that there there are possibilities, and we see nuggets of goodness, and 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 I think that can convert even the hardest of hearts um, when the conditions are right. Yeah, I I love that, and I think. What inspires me too is because um, you know the the hard work is hard work and the pain is pain and uh, and it's needed. But what inspires me is like this vision of the abundance, right? This this the, that Ron Finley garden in in his front yard, just amazing, right? And if we can apply that into the other aspects of our society, and um, you know, we need to we need to be driven by that kind of Jesus inspired vision, right? Uh, an example I see right now is even just a couple days ago, um, you know, the, the federal administration announced that they were going to be um, uh, changing the requirements for international students. You probably right. have seen this. Yes. That, you know, if you are an international student, that um, you could not, if, if you were going to take uh, to a school that was going online, 100% online for your classes in the fall, that you could not basically remain enrolled in that capacity. You either had to uh, uh, enroll in a, in, a, in a school transfer, which how would you do that uh, so quickly to a school that had in-person instruction or uh, leave. And if you don't, you have to, you could face deportation or removal proceedings. Right. And so, you know, so the cruelty of that but it, it, along with that, then you see sort of like the beauty of response and resistance from mm -hmm. people. And so there's stories coming out of professors yeah. um, and students, students organizing doing their own classes, yeah, swapping Berkeley. out classes right. and organizing one unit, three unit courses so that students can have one class of in-person instruction so that they don't have to face this situation. Yeah. And so there's the good soil, right? That's yeah. being cultivated even as these bad things sort of like come at us. That's, uh, that's a great point. And maybe we'll end here just because I'm looking at the time, Francisco. But, yeah. you know, I would say, I would venture to say uh, justice and equity is always, can always be more clever, right, uh, than injustice and inequity. And uh, so those forces that try to promote injustice for their own, right, you know, Trump, Trump is trying to use this as a kind of a leverage, right? To get schools to open, right? Not just universities, but all schools, right? Because he wants his economy back so he can get elected. And he's using people, you know, as collateral uh, and or as kind of a hostage type thing. And, um, but I think justice and equity always wins in the end, so. Amen. So you can't stop the good soil. Keep That's, working and keep cultivating. Keep, keep digging, get a dang shovel and get out there. Get dirty. <laughs> That's right. Get dirty. And see, and see something bear fruit. Right on. Francisco, great to see you. We'll see you next week. All right, Thank brother. You, friend. Take All care, right. everybody. Bye. Okay.